I'm Francesca Rudkin and welcome to another Rialto Channel podcast. Today I'm delighted to be talking to the writer and director and most likely producer of Pecking Order, Slavko Martinov. Thanks so much for joining me, Slavko. Oh, my pleasure. Happy to be here. Um, were you the producer as well? Yeah, I am. <laughs> I just yeah. happy to be here. I'm kind of not there. Forget, isn't it? well, it's all blurred reality and, and fantasy, isn't it? Okay. Well, this is the way we make yeah. films in New- this is the way we make films in New Zealand, isn't it? We'd yeah, like to do as many things as possible. Yeah, no, and um, I mean it's part of it's part of learning to make films here, which is a good thing. Um, but if you have an idea, then you kind of automatically become the producer and have to, you know, do all those hard yards as as just part of the process. Yeah. So let's start with you setting the scene. Tell us a little bit about the documentary Picking Order and how it all came about. Yeah, um, it was a really happy accident, actually. We were filming this um, other documentary in Melbourne and we were at this um, organic fair market just out of town in Melbourne and I saw these ladies selling big bags of um, organic chicken feed and uh, they're doing really well. People are just lining up buying these bags of feed and I'm thinking going on here who, who buys this stuff and so I went over and asked them and they looked at me like I was stupid and they're like well only the top breeders on the national show circuit and, it, and at that point I just said to them are you saying that there's a best in show and they're like yeah I'm like with chickens and they're like of course like I'm <laughs> so stupid for not knowing this and I, I tell you it was it was as simple as that I just looked at my co-producer Mike and he just gave me one of his nods I'm like tell me more and 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 away we went. Like we knew we had something. We just didn't know if it existed in New Zealand at all. We thought we'd be making a film in Australia. Well, I thought it was just a delight. I mean, this is a real crowd pleaser, isn't it? What 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 kind of reaction have you been getting to the documentary? Oh, it's been just great. I mean, uh, um, and and everywhere it's great. You know, like um, it premiered in um, this time last year in Toronto and. And the Canadians just loved it, and um, and in the UK, people absolutely get it if they can get past the accents, but they really enjoy the challenge. Um, and Australia definitely absolutely loves it, so uh, it's going really well. Yeah, it's, well, well, it's universal, you know, this, the themes of obsession. Um, were you able to follow the film to any of these festivals, Slavko? Yeah, you have to, um, to kick it off and help your sales agent, so I started off in Toronto and then um, went to um, the Edinburgh Film Festival, which was really great, and and then Melbourne. So in the end, I only did only did three festivals um, and then just got back to work. I was supposed to follow with them for a year, but not enough time. You've got to find work and keep going. Well, that's the thing. That, that yeah, yeah, most definitely. Yeah, all hey, the um, are great. Mm. So, as you mentioned, you you, you discovered you did, you stumbled across this idea, mm. which intrigued you, and you thought hmm, we're onto something here. Yeah. But um, how did you then meet the members of the Christchurch Poultry Bantam and <clears throat> excuse me Pigeon Club, and how did you convince them to be part of yeah. this documentary? Yeah, good question. Um, so I got back home and sort of snipped around doing some research um, trying to find some clubs and I could see that there were clubs uh, connected by South Island associations and then there's a national body. It was all very confusing and, you know, they were living back in an age where they're still sending out mailers to people to get their attention and and so even trying to get a hold of them by email, um, you know, there was a delay of about six weeks till someone responded to me. And um, and then of course you'd ask a question, had to wait another six weeks to get another response. And finally, I got myself into a club meeting, and I I thought I would I thought I would go and undercover, like just pop into a meeting and get lost in the numbers, and um, and just observe for a while to see if it you know if it had legs, right? Like otherwise not go ahead with it. But I got caught out really early on because of course everyone knows everyone, and this new guy walks in, and everyone just turns around and looks at me. And they start playing this game where they go, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And they start naming breeds, like the oh. the Chinese. Yep, oh, you yeah, know, he's a silky man, he's a silky man. And people start laying out bets. I'm just sitting there going, okay, that cover's blown. <laughs> just said, okay, uh, my name's Slavko, I'm a filmmaker. <laughs> and just had to come out with it. 
And they were like, yeah, all right. And I sort of thought, I don't quite think they understand what I'm saying. I'm going to make a film, and so I'd have to spell it out. And they were just like, oh, no, that's great. And the president went back to the association, and it turns out in the end that um, he had to push for allowing it to happen from the top. And right. They, um, and they listened to him. And, and their thing was, um, you know, this thing's dying out. Mm. If someone makes a wee film clip, um, you know, it could help us get some numbers. That was their, that and was their then, logic. Mm. And, and then did that sort of casualness towards the camp, you know, this idea, did that sort of um, translate to, you know, when you put a camera in front of their faces? How did they handle that? Do you want to know? It's the weirdest thing, and I, I doubt I'll ever get that lucky again. Um, I mean, you like to think you've got a particular skill at putting people at ease. Um, but we were kind of invisible. Yeah. And they, they really did go about their business. And um, and we'd make jokes and make it, you know, casual. And uh, it took them about five minutes to ease <laughs> in. And we just kept them busy. And um, and it was kind of seamless. Um because that was going to be my next question. You know, everybody is very open towards you. Mm, and, yeah. you know, it, it, I wondered whether there was a shift, whether you had to sort of get them to slowly open up or whether it was about trust or what. But obviously mm. they, were all, they were all just pretty relaxed about it. Yeah, you, and you have to do it very differently with each film. In this one, I thought, okay, well, look, I've got a bit of time. Um, so I told them all about, um, you know, the documents we need clearance forms. Uh, and I said, but listen, I understand you don't know me. I understand most people come in and do pieces for TV and so on and tell you everything's going to be great and they're supportive and then go away and mock you and make mm. fun of you. I'm not going to do that. Um, so what I'll do is I'm going to hold off on those clearance forms and, you know, we'll become friends and get close and at some point there'll be a, a point of no return where I will need to sign up. But, you know, I just want to put you at ease. So, yeah, it's a sensible approach. You know, and that and it worked really well um, right up until, yeah. <laughs> and but they the are film such... film very nearly didn't get made. Oh, dear. Um, yeah. But Subco, they are such great characters. I mean, when did you know, sort of once you started yeah. a film, when did you then sort of turn and look at Mike again and go, yeah, this is so going to work? Well, you know what? It's, um, it's really funny because for the longest time... Um, you know, months and months, all we had were the monthly meetings. That's all that was going on because the thing was you want to watch them and just be present and get a feeling for, like, who's going to put their hand up as a great character. And, um, and so that was good. It was just observing. Um, but I tell you what, that was like watching wallpaper dry. And at some point, because they're so understated, like real classic understated farmer types, that they would sit there and and not say anything or do anything and be so dry that after a while Mike's looking at me out of the corner of his eye because he's also the cameraman with this look like well, we need to cut and run because these people are like nearly asleep and um, and we just held in there and I said to him at one point I said watch this guy Brian just watch him and um, of course Brian had a magic about him even though he hardly said anything in these meetings. And it was just a case of being really patient. And then one day, someone said something at the back, at the back of the room. And I realized that there were decades of, of conflict brewing underneath that was being repressed because we were there. Mm. And so I had to, one by one, go and talk to them and, you know, in a way, create a sense of, you know, them allowing themselves to, to cut loose and get into whatever it was um, because they still hadn't signed consent. So if they didn't like it and things went wrong and turned pear-shaped, you know, I still can't show anything. Just mm. give it a go. Cut loose. And that was the point at which everything peeled open and everyone started talking and confiding and, and there was genuine trust built because we never took anyone's word over someone else's it was, it was, all, it was all balanced yeah. so you mentioned before that the film there was a point where the film almost sort of halted what what was that about Subco? Um, three or four times um, and one of those was after the 
you know, there were resignations along the way. And um, I would get phone calls late at night. You know, I'm out. Yep, yep. I'm out of the film. Yep. That's it. Help me out. <laughs> Stuff, and you'd listen very carefully for three quarters of an hour <laughs> to this panged, angry rant. And, and really, it was that's how you become a good producer, having to manage, you know, personalities and and try and talk them down. And uh, sometimes it got so close um that I'd have to I'd have to remind someone. Um because they're so old school and so honourable. Mm. Especially the old president. I, I ended up having to say to him one day at the end of one of these conversations, I said, Doug, I'm gonna have to remind you that you shook my hand. Oh and gorgeous. Be a big pause. Big pause. Yeah. Yep. I did. All right, boy. See you on Monday. Oh, and, and I'd, I'd put the phone down and just lie on the floor, just sweat off my forehead. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> it was moments that close, three or four times. Oh, you know, the, there's a really fine line between a mockumentary and a documentary, and I think that you revealed mm. these characters with a lot of respect and dignity. But were you Perhaps conscious it. of that line, with as you oh, were, yeah. you know, yeah. finding yeah. yourself in these incredibly wonderful situations? Absolutely, and um, because from the very beginning, you know, the film commission were great. They'd be like, you know, don't you dare make fun of these people. And I'd, I'm like, what are you talking about? Why would I do that? You know, it's mm. low-hanging fruit. But I understood what they meant. What they were saying was, you know, we feel affection for these people. I'm like, that's right. And so what I would do is situations would happen and you'd give them air and, you know, let things breathe. And then afterwards, you'd just really openly reward them and go, look, that was absolutely hilarious I tried not to wet myself mm. in that scene are you are you okay with it and they'll be like yeah yeah so we'll just be open about it you know mm. saying that was gold because, <laughs> Magic, because you realize he, what you just did yeah just check in with them you know and yeah and they'll be like yeah no that's absolutely fine it's funny and um, what's your favorite kind of chicken <laughs> it's you know if, you, if in the first six months of filming I I didn't know what was going on or what people were talking about. And then, you know, by the, no joke, by about eight months in, I'd be at a show walking along with Mike going, mm, mm, yeah, no, the cone needs trimming. No, oh, no, look at, look at that. Look at that. Look, that feather's out of place. Come on. Dude. Why did he even bring it to the show? That Really, please. We, we had our iron, you know, and we were choosing champions. And for us, it were these little English game birds. And um, they're just so neat, such... Okay, I'm going to start sounding really creepy if I start talking the lingo. But nice, tight little bodies. That's awful. But but that's how they talk, you know. Like, has she come into? Oh, she's coming to lay. She's out. You know, all these little things. This, this is the joy of being a filmmaker. Judge a show. You never know I could judge when you show. I think when you when you um, when you become a filmmaker, you never know what you're become, going to become an expert on. That's right. Yeah. Mm. Have, have you ever have you been to a chicken show since filming ended? Oh, uh, since, um, no, I just missed out the big 150th um, that they had in, and the Nationals at the same time. Um, I was away, um, yeah, at the Edinburgh Festival, and so I missed out, which was a real shame. Was a real mm. Well, you've you got to keep your eye on Slavko. Now you've got the skill. I, got to keep your eye on. Right. Should I get called upon to judge? I need to know <laughs> what I'm doing. Get the chicken. Hey, Slavko, can you tell me a little bit about your background? How did you get into filmmaking? Um, yeah, well, <laughs> a way to make me feel old. I'm 47 now, and, and people ask me that, and um, I realized that I wanted to be a filmmaker. Just back in the day, you know, our options, um, you know, when we started university, was mm. that, um, the only way to study film was to get into film school at fine art school, and the only way to get into fine art school was if you could you know, based on your paintings from school. Mm. Except I can't paint. Mm. And so, you know, no studying film for me. I studied it in theory and drama and feminist studies. And then afterwards, you know, when I graduated, I, I tried everything to be a PA for free for every producer I could find, as is the usual routine. And and no one would have me. Isn't that pitiful? And um, so I moved to America to try and catch a break and, and just never did. This sounds really pitiful. And then, um, but I, we know it's going to have a great happy ending. 
<laughs> so, and then it took me until I was 33 to to just you know come back to New Zealand and decide, look, I've just got to go for it, and and was just sending in all these ideas to the networks. You know, it was a different time, and mm. um, it took me, I think, so many failed attempts, and then one day I got a, a documentary for TV. It was 2010, and so it took me most of my life to get a to get a shot, and and so I only really started in 2010, and and a lot of that was having to make my own way with um, propaganda, the film I made before this. Um, yeah, so I feel like I've only just started, really. Yeah. But propaganda was it's a really strange. interesting film that that had a a, a little bit of a strange. cult following in around the world, didn't it? Well, it keeps. Well, it's having a resurgency now because, mm. um, you know, back at the time when I was making it, I was trying to draw attention to you know, what we now call fake news, if you like, um, which is now just mainstream. And the fact that it was supposed to have come out of North Korea means, you know, it still gets passed around the internet with people saying mm. it's real, no, it's not real, which was kind of the point. Yeah, and no, I'm really proud of that film. And it was... Um, yeah, it's um, but very different from Picking Order, obviously. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, still really happy with that film. But so you finally, you finally, you know, we're, we're making films. Is it everything yeah. you thought it would be? Do you love it as much as you, you know, you dreamed? Um, it's. Um, is is there a? <laughs> am I supposed to say something really positive about film? Right no, now? because I I don't think I I don't think I've met a, met a filmmaker who's who's said to me, oh, it's a blast every minute. <laughs> Yeah, Ever, no, you know, it's I really can, hard can, work. So I can, so I can be honest mm. and say I wake up each day wondering why, why yeah. did I do that? Why did I persist so hard for for this? And that sounds dark, and you're not supposed to ever complain because, of course, should you ever get to make a film, you're incredibly privileged, right? Like, what are mm. the numbers? It's it's insane, and so for that. Um, you know, I'm lucky and I'm working right now. I've got three projects in front of me. And, um, but it's strangely, Francesco, it just gets harder. And, yeah. um, and it's, there's a thrill to it. Um, because of course it's not just about making the film, it's the years of developing it just to get it over the line, um, to even get started and, it's sort of masochism. I don't think there's any other way around it. You know, mm. It's, mm. it's torturous, but there's a there's a thrill in that challenge. You know, um, so I keep telling myself it's the only way I can keep going. <laughs> so three projects in front of you. Well, that's pretty exciting. Ms. Slavko, thanks so much for talking to us. We it's are absolutely pleasure. thrilled to be playing Picking Order, um, and oh, that yeah, is screening on Rialto Channel, nineteenth of Fantastic. April at eight thirty p.m. Fantastic. Might just tune in myself. It's been a while. You yeah, go on. Since I saw it. <laughs> oh, awesome. Thanks so much, Savco.